How do you see job roles evolving in the teams that you're leading with the AI coming in in the picture? What was your initial set of like uh, advancements for building that up in uh, Microsoft database? We have seen this like rise and fall of vector databases. If you have data that's outside of operational systems, we do have solutions. Our AI search is, is a great example. What would you say is the next step yeah. for ev evolution of a data? What are some of the best kinds of toolkits and frameworks that you've seen that makes it scalable for enterprises, database as a place for storage, now suddenly has become the wealth of intelligence. How much more we can achieve uh, with AI coming in? Hi Shivesh, thank you so much for joining me for this podcast. It's been an amazing experience at Ignite so far and all the practical uh, tips that was being shared and the demo style of Keynote was something which I was very fascinated with. So thanks. Great to connect with you Ashwarya. Yeah. Pleasure. <laughs> thanks, Shirish. Um, so first things first, I would love to understand from your perspective. Um, we have seen this like rise and fall of vector databases, right? Like at one point, people were obsessed with vector databases. There were new startups coming up with newer technology, newer algorithm to really build and search for embeddings. And then people started seeing there's a fall of vector databases, which wasn't necessarily a fall which basically meant that now this is a default for how databases should be working and how information should be searchable. So what was your initial set of like uh, advancements for building that up in uh, Microsoft databases? Yeah, so firstly, I acknowledge your observations are spot on, right? It is exactly when ChatGPT came onto the scene two years ago, three years ago almost. Um, if there was a lot of hype for vector databases and eventually it sort of subsided. But the realization that everybody has, and I think it, it it happens all the time. It happened with JSON indexing, XML indexing, if you kind of go back two decades ago, a full text, spatial. They always try to go create bespoken architectures, bespoken solutions, only to realize that these are nothing but specialized indexes in databases. I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't have bespoken architectures and solutions. There are places where they make sense. NoSQL systems is one of them. Graph is another one. Um, but in this case, what ended up happening is that this is truly an index you do want to have the operational databases do their thing, which is, you know, the usual asset transactions, atomicity, consistency, etc. Now, you want to ensure that semantic operations are really part of that. So I think, I mean, I'm glad, you know, people are realizing it and uh, we at Microsoft make sure that all of our databases have vector indexing built into it instead of thinking of it as something else. If you have data that's outside of operational systems, we do have solutions. Our AI search is, is a great example. If you have data that's only inside the operational database for, for you know, your enterprise systems records, user-facing records, anything that's operational, we want to ensure that vector indexing is part and parcel of that. So the pattern that kind of really, you know, flipped the switch on this one, in my opinion, is rack pattern. Because what ends up happening is that people have a lot of awesome abilities to fine-tune, post-training, and all that kind of stuff. But they're always going to be limited because the enterprise data, the data that many of these companies really need to intersect with the LLMs is locked into their enterprise databases, right? They're not going to open up, hey, what is the benefits policy of a company? That's not going to be available for any LLM to be, you know, to, done, to be done with whatever, right? You could do some expensive uh, sort of post-training or whatever if you want to do it, but that's not really the way to go. It's not, it's not practical, right? So instead, you basically want to do a rack pattern where you take in all the goodness of LLM and then you ask the database, hey, could you enhance this with the information that I'm looking for? And that, I think, is the place where the vector embeddings inside a database clicked very well. Yeah. And that's just the beginning of it. Then you have a lot more scenarios now in terms of really bringing in LLMs inside the database, embeddings inside the database. Uh, so I'm really glad that the transition happened, but I would say RAG is sort of the place where the teams have started realizing it. Absolutely. And I feel like RAG is also matured a lot. And where we used to see database as a place for storage, now suddenly has become the wealth of intelligence that AI can really pull from and give you better sources, whether it's just enterprise search, like pulling in information or agentic capabilities of going in doing something like referring to one database and doing something on the other one and like, you know, having all of those tool calling capabilities to it. So from your perspective, with all the complexities of draft rag pattern, agentic rag pattern, uh, with latency issues, with the orchestration and multimodality, etc., what are some of the best practices and like what are some of the best kinds of 
tool kits and frameworks that you've seen that makes it scalable for enterprises who have say like stored uh, storage databases with Microsoft see I think uh, you know all, all these things come down to a couple of important aspects one is you want to have an architecture that is really good for your data your data platform architectures just to be simple uh, when I simple and complete uh, so simple meaning like you know you really want to have one platform that can it has one copy, it's a consistent copy and all those goodness. It needs to be effective and complete because you you can't have one kind of a static data. Data comes in different forms. It's born in streams in one places. It's born in enterprise operational stuff in other places. It's born as iceberg in some places, perhaps, you know, a parquet format and whatnot. So you really need to have a data foundation that captures all this stuff. You need to have an architecture that basically moves the data to your models in the place and the agentic frameworks, really. Uh, you can pick, you know, there's lots of solutions in, in Microsoft. We have a really good stack, but there needs to be a layer where you're really doing the compute of the models on top of the data efficiently. And then you need to expose all this stuff with the right sort of application interface. Um, you could be, you know, it, it could be any application in your case. The enterprise cases can have um, maybe a employee chat experiences or whatever, but they need to, that stack needs to be really good. So that's kind of the mental model that I always tell people that, you know, you need to have that right framework. So, and it applies to what we offer as well to the company. So, and that is the reason why we offer a stack that is exactly mimicking it. You have a data platform with Fabric. You then have the, uh, the models and the agentic application frameworks, et cetera, in Foundry in Microsoft Foundry. And then on top of it, you have like, we bring all the stuff into our own productivity seats, our own application uh, platforms, like Copilot and 365 Copilot and whatnot. And, but we also expose all this stuff in all kinds of application platforms, in all kinds of developer frameworks. So if you, you may have VS Code extensions, you may have you know, our own orchestration agents or whatever, but that is the simple stack. And I think that really goes a long way. So I have an interesting question for you. Yeah. A lot of times when we are seeing going going from like non-relational databases, relational databases, graph databases, vector databases, knowledge graph, whatever we have right now, I see that it's somewhere lagging behind exploration of a use case. We first discover a use case, we see how the data is being collected, how it should ideally be stored in an optimal manner, and then design the database around it, which is standard across different organizations, right? From your perspective, with the new use cases that we are seeing, with yeah. like agentic use cases, with the, the the way like we are finding new modalities yeah. integrated with like generative models, right. what would you say is the next step yeah. for ev evolution of a database? Yeah, see, I mean, it's a fantastic question. You have a, you're a really good observation here. So one of the things that database community has sort of been uh, been dealing with and thinking about is, do we really need these many modalities? Do we need a non-relational database, a graph database, and sometimes a spatial indexing database, a te full text index? Elasticsearch, you could argue it's a new kind of a database. It's yeah. not the same, but you, do. you even have caching databases, like Redis wants to call itself a database, right? Um, I think what I have, and I have tried it myself in my own like you know career in databases, what, what I have learned is that databases are fine-tuned and they're highly optimized for how the data is stored and how the data is being inserted and optimized uh, and obviously retrieved in, in different form factors. What ends up happening is that operationally, analytics is one thing. Analytics, you have time. You have basically, you know, these are like generally bad jobs and you're running them uh, at a certain cadence. You could do batching and, you know, you're not operating at the at the millisecond cadence, you're operating. Yes, they are very mission critical. They're extremely important. On the operational side, it's it's millisecond cadence, right? So when you are at a millisecond cadence, every decision in terms of optimizing the engine down to the level of how are you serializing the data, how is your query engine really manipulating that data matters a lot. And so I have come to the conclusion that there's no one tool that fits it all. You really do need these different kinds of form factors. But you don't have to take it to an extreme, right? You, I think having a relational model and a non-relational model is plenty, right? There might be a few other ifs and like, there might be bells and whistles around it. You want to have caching here in a different way. You may want graph engines in certain way, et cetera. But relational, non-relational, that trade-off is very clearly defined. Relation, acid, functionally rich query, non-relational, really designed for like, you know, internet scale, user-facing applications with a, a massive geo-replicator kind of an opportunity and that kind of stuff. Those two are really, I think, you know, they cover 90% of the cases. There will be definitely, uh, you know, there are some cases of 
I've seen some cases where they've created array databases, right? Uh, and, you know, I'm sure there are use cases. I don't think I, I, will, I, will, this, I will not disagree with that. But 90-95% of the use cases fit into these two buckets. And most of the modern databases are evolving amazingly. Postgres is a fantastic example. Yeah. Yeah. Because of its extensibility, you can really put in graph in it. You could put in spatial in it. Yeah. You can even, you know, we've added JSON support, BSON support in mm. Postgres. Uh, we have a, an offering called DocumentDB, which is actually built, it's a NoSQL system built on top of Postgres. So I think, you know, these two systems really cover a lot of ground. But to think that there's some kind of a grand unified theory, I think it, that that's not true either. So maybe just one last thing, which is uh, probably like a million trillion dollar question to a lot of people is, how do you see job roles evolving in the teams that you're leading? with the AI coming in, in the picture. Now, we're very excited. I think uh, it's one of those situations where we feel like we are all getting productive uh, and we, are, we have a lot of work. <laughs> Software engineering is full of a lot of work. So I don't, I don't, I'm not thinking beyond the fact that, wow, we have an amazing tooling now. We can do, go, go do a lot more productive work. So that's really how we are thinking about it. Uh, it's exciting to see how much more we can achieve uh, with a AI coming in. I think that's kind of really the, the, you know, the boundaries of where we are. Reactivity. Yeah, it's a huge boost. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so cool. much. Ashwarya, we're connecting with you.